Adamu. And to you, David, as you pointed out earlier, the humanitarian disaster that Africa faces is not just from wars and conflict, it's also from climate displacement. Of course, um, uh, climate uh, change, you know, has affected, you know, Africa seriously, especially when you talk about the Lake Chad Basin and, and the Sahel, uh, where conflicts, you know, have emanated from uh, local farmers and, and, and cattle rearers. Uh, you know, um, in, in Nigeria, we've seen that, in, in Mali. And, and these conflicts, you know, somehow lead, you know, people that believe they can't be protected. Uh, by the national security to, you know, uh, do a self-help, you know, by uh, either carrying weapons themselves, which they can readily find in, in the black market, or enlisting themselves uh, into uh, local jihadist organizations, where they uh, then pay them and, you know, get the protection. So th there is this issue which, uh, you know, needs to be resolved. But of course, as you know, these are long-term uh, strategies that are required you know, to deal with the climate change issues. And, you know, governments need to really take that into uh, uh, proactive action and make sure that uh, climate change does not impact on, on the security situation. And, and the other hand is this, this, the conflict themselves impacting on, on climate change. So I, I think you've got to look at it from, from, those, from both sides and, and understand that the initiatives in Africa must focus a lot on, on, on this anti um, uh, 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 terrorism issues, which you know, then lead to other bigger crises. So th this is a big issue, uh, uh, Charles, and I hope that African governments can, can really uh, look at the issue of climate change and, and wars, especially within the Sahel and the Lake Chad, and, and see how they can really um, uh, you know, claw back you know, some of this impact that it has as we speak. And, and, and uh, Dr. Kabiru Adamu, just looking at this withering humanitarian crisis across Africa. I mean, in addition to things like climate change, uh, natural disasters and so on, you've got um, South Sudan, Congo, Lake Chad, Cameroon, Nigeria, etc., all conflict-induced, or at least partly, perhaps majorly conflict-induced. Yeah, are you referring to the humanitarian, mm, the humanitarian. Ch ch challenge? Yes, um, you know, it's, it's well documented um, and of course the UN uh, has severally released statements um, in showing clearly mm. the impact of um, the conflict as it were on the humanitarian um, the challenge or disaster in uh, pa parts of Africa, including of course um, Nigeria. Um, part of a, one of the most disturbing, I think, developments is where it appears uh, the humanitarian community and the governments in the con these countries, unfortunately, are uh, not working together. There seems to be um, some form of disagreement between them on what constitutes humanitarian support. Mm. So uh, there is a clear need for humanitarian assistance, and then those that are giving the humanitarian as assistance are unfortunately not getting the cooperation of the government. And tied to that, I think it's this um, perhaps long-held belief that humanitarian agencies have some elements of espionage um, mm. links. They've got their uh, own agenda. Agenda, e exactly. So that has also crept into Africa. Uh, in Nigeria, as an example, you hear the narrative by the humanitarian com communi community that the space is increasingly being um, constricted um, just over the weekend. Uh, an international non-governmental organization has it had its offices shut down in mm. Borno, and the reasons was um, there is a procedure for movement of goods from the capital into the hinterland, and allegedly that organization did not follow that procedure. Um, I mean, in all of this, uh, while we are not um, blind to the fact that the military itself is also sometimes involved in humanitarian assistance, mm. because in most times it is the first humanitarian agency to arrive locations that are uh, sometimes riddled by, by conflict. But where you have this great need, um, just as has been de depicted by the video you showed mm. um, in Burkina Faso, um, and then you have agencies coming in to assist, and then they are not getting the right support from the home government. It, it paints a really, really um, gloomy picture. So I think that's cr very important. Um, multilateral agencies 
such as the UN that provide platform for discussions of such issues where these countries are members need to take this issue seriously and emphasize the importance of humanitarian a assistance and as much as possible find a way to do away with this uh, lack of trust and confidence that leads to uh, the kind of blockages that we've seen. That's a very good point. And David, I mean, you're, you're there in Europe. Uh, you're talking to us from our studios in London. What is the perception there about what the stumbling blocks are uh, to the smooth mounting of uh, humanitarian assistance in Africa? I think it's all about uh, uh, management, uh, Charles. Uh, of course, when this humanitarian crisis uh, happen as a result of war or as a result of climate change, um, then you, you're looking at how the, the, the country that it happens within, for example, in Nigeria or Niger or, or Mali or any of the countries in, in Somalia, uh, how, do they, how do they deal with it? Uh, and you know, that is a significant uh, issue that you know, has been experienced. Uh, most people that are displaced as a result of climate change are uh, then, you know, made to be further victims, you know, when they move from one area to another because the receiving community is not, um, uh, you know, much more, it's not giving a, a greater awareness as to um, what these people are going through. So it becomes a, a matter of, uh, of, uh, of a tough war where, you know, uh, local communities believe that they don't have sufficient resources for themselves, and, and then they have these other people coming into their communities. So I think the issue of management of humanitarian crisis, but also predicting how these uh, crises have impact on, on receiving communities and how they further generate to conflict is quite important. And that is where, uh, you know, the African Union should be looking at sponsoring uh, very, um, you know, critical research areas to look at how these things can be, you know, tackled, you know, proactively, uh, but also reactively, of course, when, when it does occur. So I, I think there needs to be a very clear plan of action, um, and that can only be done if the African Union takes charge, um, rather than, you know, somehow uh, allowing other international organizations that, you know, actually meaning well, but, you know, have very little experience in terms of the, uh, the cultural dynamics of what is happening in the continent. So I think if the African Union takes that pivotal role and plays it the role of, you know, the African overseer, as he's supposed to do, then, you know, the humanitarian crisis would be well managed. But again, you know, it requires a comprehensive national strategy for crisis management of that nature. And, and we've seen that backfire in Nigeria and other countries. But I hope that 2020 may give us a, a leeway to see how these countries can deal with it. Well, one of the interesting points made there, Dr. Adam, who, uh, that David made, I think, uh, previously, is the fact that when you look at places, I think maybe you made that point, places like Libya, for example, that you're not having that, it's, it's, you're not, we're not looking at African solutions to problems in Libya, but I suppose the perception internationally and with a lot of countries perhaps in that region is that the conflict was induced in the first place by international intervention. That's the perception out there. Um, of course, uh, it was felt that whatever um, intervention um, the international um, partners did, they would follow up and ensure some form of stability. But that wasn't what mm. happened. And um, of course, it, 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 you know, it's quite ironic actually that all ha um, Gaddafi happened. And I mean, the reasons are based on where you, your, what perspective you, you have on the issue. It happened. But then, um, how many years after, the country is still in turmoil. Mm. There's almost a civil war going, going on in the country, and the effect is being felt in, across in, the in, continent. In, in, in the sub region, as it were. Um, most of the weapons that we're seeing in the hands of you know, jihadists, um, bandits, mm. um, name them. Uh, com most of it is coming from me. Le well, I, I want to talk about that when we come back, because all these things, as you correctly pointed out, terrorism, transnational crime, communal conflicts between herders and farmers, 
you know, violent urban crime, cattle rustling, they're all being fueled by the proliferation of firearms, which have become the weapons of choice, replacing traditional and less deadly weapons. We're going to talk about that when we come back. You're watching The Arise interview, plenty more still ahead as we continue our review of security in Africa in 2019 and assess areas of concern in 2020. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Onyegolu. Silencing the guns by 2020. That was the proclaimed goal of the African Union back in 2016, a goal which many experts believe is unattainable, especially if illegal arms continue to flourish. Around 40 million unregistered small weapons are currently in circulation on the continent. Everything from large lorry loads of arms to petty weapons smuggled by individuals make it across porous borders. According to the UN, the trade can often be traced back to criminal networks, corrupt officials, and even returning members of peacekeeping missions. The cross-border trade has raised grave concerns in Nigeria. Uh, African countries also manufacture various kinds of small arms and light weapons, and and these are also and they're also, of course, homemade, uh, a, a sort of homemade weapons production industry, isn't there? Um, uh, you've mentioned the local manufacturing, you know, sources, mm. but the one that I think is more concerning, which unfortunately is not well um, documented, is the armory of um, government um, security agencies, mm. either corrupt members of the um, state um, security departments selling them or, you know, yes, sometimes even about that. hiring them out yep. uh, for illegal purposes or in some instances, as it happened recently in Niger and of course in Nigeria, where you see the terrorist um, raiding uh, you know, mm. military formations and other security uh, formations and then taking over their armory and, you know, cutting away the ones they're interested in and then, of course, touching the ones they're, they're, not, they're not interested in. Um, and, of course, by doing that, increasing the number of, you know, uh, weapons in, uh, in mm. their disposal. So the sources are there and, unfortunately, they are increasing by day. Um, a recent study by um, a German-based uh, organization uh, showed clearly the correlation between the increase in this um, small arms and light weapons proliferation in Africa and then the illicit um, fun funds that are uh, be coming in, in mm. into Africa. Criminal networks uh, who want to support the flow of these illicit funds unfortunately control these networks and so they arm um, groups, uh, sometimes through all of some of the channels that we've mentioned, mm. uh, from Europe, uh, from Asia, as it were, and then of course through local uh, manufacturing sources so that right. they can control those networks and in the process, um, you know, the continuation of the kind of conflicts and secu insecurity challenges that um, are inherent in Africa. And, and uh, David, I presume you can hear me now. Yes. Yeah, we, we lost you for a minute there. Um, and of course, of all these weapons that we've talked about that proliferate across Africa, the AK-47 remains the most dangerous killing tool on the continent, from what I read, causing more deaths, apparently, than bombs, grenades or mines. Yes, uh uh, of course, uh, Charles, the AK-47 has become the uh, weapon of choice uh, because it's quite easy to, uh, to operate. It's quite easy to cause uh, a huge amount of casualty. Uh, it's not as expensive as other sophisticated weapons. So it's, uh, it's a weapon of choice for most organized crime groups and, and terrorist organizations. And, you know, of course, uh, uh, African governments, you know, and non-state groups have spent and continue to spend millions to buy these AK-47s. So it, it has become the weapon of choice. Um, again, as uh, uh, my colleague uh, Kebi Adamu said, uh, there are, uh, the, the way these jihadists and these criminal groups get these weapons is quite interesting uh, for, uh, for research because uh, one of the things that we've seen recently, uh, not just in the Luktaku Guma region of Sahel, but also in Nigeria, is that the uh, jihadist organizations have become more armed and they are now cutting away weapons uh, 
uh, from the, you know these uh, armed forces, and and then you know increasing uh, their sophistication. So it, it tells you that um, yes, you have this uh, uh, increase in, in in proliferation of arms from neighboring countries. Um, that African governments are spending lots and lots of 